Hi everybody, um, I've got a bunch of questions here about coping saws and um, I think they're great questions and there's a lot of confusion surrounding coping saws. Whether you, one of the main ones is whether you use them on the push stroke or on the pull stroke. On the pull stroke. And um, I felt this one particularly, it says pushing or pulling, does the type of wood and the work at hand affect the choice to push or pull? And I said, no, uh, in my view, the push is the only way forward. So that was my attempt at a pun. Um, uh, but in my view, I've always used a coping saw on the push stroke because that's the way I was trained. And in reality, that was the way all of the men that I ever worked with as a boy used their coping saws. Uh, and they always used them on the, pulse, uh, on the push stroke. So why was that? Well, they use them for cutting dovetails. Let me give you an example. If um, I was making a dovetail and I cut my dovetails like this and I took my coping saw, I've got my line on this side and I take out that waste wood in the middle I would use it on the push stroke because I can see my line from this side. If I was working on a pull stroke, this one is set up on a pull stroke, I find that works fine too. It doesn't matter which direction you go in. What I want to do is suggest that there are times when you push into the wood and when you might want to pull into the wood. Having said that, I might use the pull stroke once every 10 years in a situation where inside a cupboard or something like that, I might want to use it on the pull stroke. Mostly it's going to depend on how you were introduced to the coping saw or how the coping saw was introduced to you. So it's a matter of choice. So this one is from Vincent Lavarin, who is asking that first question. So would I use it on the push stroke or the pull stroke? I would use it probably on whichever way I was introduced to it in the beginning. Does the thickness of the wood affect that? It does, I think. It does because if you took a piece of wood like this and put this in the vise, it's quite thick. I'm on the pull stroke. Uh, so I'm pulling into the wood. I feel like I don't have very much power. If I'm working with a push stroke, I feel like I have a lot more power and I have a lot more control. That's me and that's because I was introduced to that first. So his next question, uh, when you're cutting a tight curve or shallow curve, uh, does that, is that effect on the push or the pull stroke? It doesn't make any difference. As you just saw, this is the saw on the pull stroke. So if I'm cutting my dovetail waist out, so here, dovetails, taking the waist out of the middle, this is on the pull stroke, so I go in and I'm pulling, 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 I can turn equally on the pull or the push stroke, that's because I'm used to working with coping saw, so use them for 50 odd years, you might not find it so easy, when I'm working with my push stroke saw, so let's say I wanted to it's always going to be on the, uh, the cut stroke. So if you're working on a push stroke, I make my turn every time I come around this corner. I start here, I'm, this is the push stroke, remember. So I'm pushing and I'm turning, pushing and turning, pushing and turning, not pull and turn. Because if you try on the, on the pull stroke with a push stroke positioning of your teeth, it won't turn the corner. It'll just keep binding and binding and actually bend the, te the, the whole blade. It'll cause a twist in the blade. Okay, great questions. Okay, cutting with the grain or across the grain, it makes no difference. It doesn't matter which way you go with the, the teeth, cutting both directions, whether it's across or with the grain, it's the same. So it depends on what you prefer. The hardness of the wood, you, well, softwoods can be quite difficult sometimes, but hardwoods have this consistent hardness across the density of the wood. It's to do as much with density as it is with hardness. So whether it's soft or hardwood, I, I, it wouldn't make any difference. It certainly makes no difference to me. 
Um, what does make a difference is the thickness of the wood. The thickness can, so I was using this big thicky chunk here. That will make a difference if I'm, whereas if I'm using a thinner piece, it does make a difference. Um, but preferably, I think the very thin material, say you got down to something an eighth of an inch or less, then you might want to use it on the, on the um, pull stroke using a platform like this. So in this case, you'd put your platform here in the vise, you'd put your piece of wood on the top and you would work down this, this way. Uh, but that, I don't usually do any kind of marquetry or thin wood that way, so I usually probably, I'm not the best one to ask for that one, but that's my view. Uh, okay, this one is from Bob in Texas. It's my understanding and experience that coping saws blades should be installed to cut on the pull stroke, is that correct? No, not really. Um, and we've just really addressed that, but just to reiterate, it depends on what you want. I get much more power from my shoulders and my arms going into a push stroke. Um, the, the, um, the frame itself, some people have said the frame collapses when you use it on the push stroke. So when you're pushing, when the, when the blade is pushing into the wood, they're saying they get this flex here. That's usually a very flimsy frame. If you bought a, a, either a new or a second-hand Eclipse coping saw, and they're still manufactured today, um, it will not bend under pressure once it's tightened in there. You won't bend that, that uh, frame. So here I'm looking at t tensioning the blade. Should you slacken off the tension after use? Will it prolong the blade life? The next question, is there a good method by which proper tension can be achieved on a coping saw? How, is it, how tight is tight enough? I have snapped a few blades and suspect I'm making them tight. The reality is that you tighten that blade as tight as you can get it between these two points because I doubt whether there is ever a frame that's so strong that it would snap the blade. I realize what you're saying, what one or two might be saying, is that they seem to snap the blades quite easily. Usually the blade snap is caused by, by making turns with the blade in the frame at the wrong time. So if I took a piece of wood and I was cutting, say I'm on the push stroke here, so if, uh, if I was making turns and, and twisting the blade or the frame of the saw in the cut like this, at the wrong time I would be putting pressure on the blade in, because it's under tension. But if you're cutting in control, if you're measuring the pressure you're applying, let me go a little lower and it won't be so rattly. If I, so here, I can make the turns, there is no risk at all of braking. I can change direction. As long as I change direction at the right time, I should have no problem resulting in breaking that blade. So that's really the reason. Usually it's because our body, our hand, our eyes are not aligned properly and we're not quite getting it right in synchrony when we're making the turn. So we're putting undue pressure on the blade. So I hope that answers it. So you can't over tighten it. You can have it too slack. Just tighten this all the way up until it won't go any further and you'll have the right tension. Great, and this one is about dovetailing. Why not use a coping saw to clear the majority of the waste in the dovetails? How does one make a sharp turn when cutting out waste while making dovetails? I've demonstrated that one already. Uh, when I try to cut out the waste, dovetailing the blade resists turning horizontal at the bottom of the cut, what to do? Okay, coast, cut straight. It's all to do with what I just said about changing direction and being in control and measuring it. Now I can turn the corner with my coping saw quite quickly, but I have it coordinated. So I've cut down the walls of my dovetail. I want to remove the waste, left or right. I make that turn on the right point. So I'm making it on the forward cut all the time. Changing direction again. So I take a series of short cuts like this when I'm changing direction. Once I've made it, I can take advantage to the full six inch length of the blade or five inch, whichever size it is. So that's that one. Um, 
dovetail, there is the other thing about dovetails is somebody asked me that question, why don't we use it to remove the waste? Usually we do and we can, if we're working on a piece, if I was making a beehive, um, a tool tote, something like that, I might remove the bulk of the waste just by, like you saw me do, take that waste out and then pare down to the cut line. That's not uncommon to do that. In fact, I did it a long time in my own life that way, but I came to a point where I felt got the, I got the better refinement when I just did it with pear cuts and chop cuts at the same time. I got a much cleaner finish on my dovetails. Let's see what we've got hidden back here. Difference between a fret saw and a coping saw. Um, I've never really, I do own a, a fret saw, but I've never really found a use for them because I don't do the really fine work that fret saws uh, and jeweler's saws are used for. Some are used for metal. A jeweler's saw might be used for metal. It has super fine teeth. And, um, and the same with the, the fret saw is used in conjunction with the platform. Just like I said here, you've got this tall platform. You put your thin piece of wood on the top and you cut on the downstroke so you're pulling into the surface. What you've done in effect usually is you've taken a piece of wood and you've got a piece of paper on the top glued to the surface and on that surface you've got the shapes that you want to cut out from that surface and then you take your saw which is usually almost all, well, it would be on the pull stroke and you work down from above like this and you're working down it from above with the, with the fret saw, the jeweler saw, whatever and they're really, all they are is a very fine-toothed version of the coping saw and they're not as deep here or they're super deep. The jeweler's saw is not very deep. The fret saw is very deep. So you can get a long way into your sheet material and you can cut through that material quite readily. So that's the difference. That's why, that's the contrast. Maybe used for veneering a lot, maybe using for inlays, things like that. What's the difference between a fret saw and a coping saw? If you, um, it's the size of the teeth as well. Even with coping saws, you get the different size of the teeth. You can get some really super, super fine, 32, 42, 52 teeth per inch. Very, very fine. That makes a huge difference, especially on very, very thin material. Okay, buying a coping saw. This is from Robert. Do I need to buy one of the new expensive truss design coping saws and the second question, recommendations for purchasing a decent coping saw. Are there any contemporary brands worth considering what to look for when buying a saw? Well, I think it's more the blade than the saw frame, to be frank with you. Um, these do not collapse. They cut about the same as some of the very expensive saws do. And uh, so it's more to do with the fineness of the blade. I've got two or three blades here. Uh, this one has twice as many teeth per inch than this one does. So I would use this on super fine work. And it's more to do with that because I've found that for a £10 or a $10 coping saw, you can do everything that you would ever need to do with any type of wood. So I think it's more a matter of personal choice. You like the idea uh, of something that is more expensive. You can afford it. If that's what you want to do, I think it's just a matter of choice. Buying blades, blade TPI, okay. Hello Paul, most of the coping saw blades I find are 14 TPI, but I think I saw you mention that you use one with more teeth than that. What do you normally recommend? I think 14 TPI is, is quite fine for say coping out some materials like this one here. If I was coping a shape on this one and I wanted to cope say here and then here, here and here, I would just generally use a 14, this one is a 14 teeth per inch, this one here, so I would find this more than adequate. For cutting out my material. Would I come up on the cut? Probably not. I would go from top.
to bottom. And that's generally what I might do for my coping cut. So that's how I would use it. That's the, um, the size of tooth generally acceptable. But when I get onto the thinner material or the dovetail material that I was talking, this thin material here, I would change to maybe a 20 tooth per inch, something like that. I don't know that I would go any finer than that for general joinery and woodworking. Technique, aha. Uh -huh. I think we've covered all the techniques in the last few minutes. Are there any exercises we can do to practice and make better use, better, and become better at using the coping saw? I think it's a good idea to practice both pull and push strokes and, and decide for yourself which you want, whether you want the pull stroke or the, or the push stroke. I think you should be open to possibilities of changing the direction of the teeth when you're working with the saw. I think there's nothing wrong with that. My issue or fear with the saw is keeping it 90 degrees. I, I get that, I definitely get that. But you know, sometimes when we're using a coping saw and we're doing a coping cut, we actually do uh, cut to the line, but not square. We cut out of square on purpose because we want the fore edge of the cut line, the joint line that's visible, say on a skirting board, a baseboard, architrave, things like that we might want to see the, the uh, top uh, corner going together perfectly, whereas on the back edge it's not seen and nobody would know whether it was out of square or not. But I think there's nothing wrong with practicing cutting square with any saw. When you, when you start, first start using a saw, there are things I think to cutting with a, with a coping saw that you have to get used to. So in this case, I want this square cut. I want to cut square down. So there's a tendency. We tend to lock our bodies. We have this rigidity. I see it with planes. I see it with hand saws, dovetail saws, things like that, where we rigidly lock our bodies. When in reality, most of the time, we need to be more sensitive, and to be more sensitive, we need to loosen our grip. So we don't have a bulldog grip on this. I'm turning the corner. I'm making more cuts per uh, minute than I would normally on the vertical cut. I make my turn, loosen up on the stroke. I want to make a tight turn on this. More cuts per stroke, keeping it square. What about vibration? There are vibrations. Sometimes when we're working with this, we're overhanging. We can change direction this way, like this. We want to turn to a vertical cut again. I would say you need to be firm, but not stiff, not rigid, not, not, um, not overly tight. And a lot of that is dismantling the way we feel because it's our bodies that are tight, our muscles are tight, our sinews are tight. And it's about our attitude towards this. We sometimes want to force an issue rather than relax into it and let that turn take its course. All right, this is a bonus. Alexander from St. Petersburg in Russia. Dear Paul, one more question from a total novice. I would like to make some wooden puzzles for my daughter using coping saw. What maximum thickness of material can a coping saw cope? I ask because I need rather thick puzzle bricks. Which, what materials could you recommend in my case? Thank you in advance. Alex. Okay, Alex. I think probably a, a good maxim might be to go no more than three quarters of an inch. So I, if, I hope that that's thick enough for a puzzle piece. So I would say that anything from maybe quarter of an inch thick to three quarters of an inch thick is a good size to work with with a coping saw. I should show you the good side of, of what I coped here because the good side is really quite crisp and clean. Um, if I wanted it even finer, I would probably choose a much finer toothed blade. I think that might be it. 
I hope this has answered your questions on how to cope with a coping saw. But uh, I don't think it is a one-size-fits-all, finer teeth, bigger teeth, more expensive pieces, uh, 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 tools, less expensive. You don't really have to spend very much. You can buy a pack of blades relatively inexpensively, and you can get fine tooth blades that will cope with just about anything. So I hope you enjoy uh, getting used to your coping saw, and this certainly is a good thing. I think it's a good thing to practice first before you actually work on the piece. You get used to the grain direction, you get used to the density of the wood, you get used to materials like plywoods and MDF even, things like that, and you can start coping with anything.